Welcome to Networking Rx, a podcast devoted to helping business professionals like you enhance your networking skills in order to become more proficient giving and receiving quality business referrals and improving the overall quality of your life and the lives of those around you. The Networking Rx podcast is a production of AmSpirit Business Connections, an organization whose mission is to empower business success through networking. Welcome to the Networking Rx podcast. I'm your host, Frank Egan, founder and president of AmSpirit Business Connections. Today, we have another great guest, as our ongoing subscribers know. And if you don't, you're going to hear it now. Often on this podcast, I will share ideas, insights, and best practices for building professional relationships and giving us ideas on excelling at business networking. Occasionally, however, I will be interviewing experts, subject matter experts, authors, speakers, thought leaders, social scientists from time to time. And these are people who have the knowledge to help us build better relationships. They work with clients all the time. They do studies on these things and help us understand better how uh, better understand how we we work. Um, today on the program, I've got Jill Valdez, and Jill has been helping people for over 18 years, helping them with better systems for their company, helping them with better communication in the company, helping them overcome obstacles that uh, keep them from being all that their purpose to be. Uh, for 16 years, she was in the nonprofit sector uh, at, at both the startup and established uh, corporations. Then in 2016, um, like so many, a corporate restructuring caused her to figure out she needed a new career or wanted a new career. Um, so she went back to school and fi finished her uh, her bachelor's in psychology and uh, got a job as a project manager and uh, um, started working on her master's, which she completed in 2018. Uh, but along the way, she realized that everything she was doing with the nonprofit world was relevant in the for-profit sector, which I guess to me is not a surprise um, because people are people. And so she has a she has a passion for helping companies and she's got her own organization um, link, uh, which we'll talk about. And uh, she um, works providing strategies for staff development, aligning employees' passions with you know the company's vision. Um, and she also has a, an ebook out there, The Ultimate Guide to Bringing Out the Best in Your People. Jill, welcome to the program. Thanks, Frank. It's great to be here again. Yeah, it's been a it's been a little bit, um, but uh, um, you're now living in Portland. Uh, well, you were yep. you were living down in Arizona <laughs> last we spoke, and now you're up yep. in the, up up in the Northwest. Um, but uh, I guess. Let's, you know, let's jump into your book here and you know, just jump into your work, you know, yeah. um, you, you know, you talk about for profits and not for profits and the people being the same. Um, what are the, you know, I guess, what were the things that really caused you to have that revelation that, that these people were? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I so in the nor nonprofit sector, everything is very volunteer driven. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get to motivate people by a paycheck. Um, you have to learn how to work with people really well. You have to learn how to um, motivate them by showing them how they align their passion and their talents and who they are with the vision and the mission of the company. And, and that's their motivation for coming in to, to being a part. Well, I jumped into the for-profit sector and I thought, oh, well, they've already got this figured out. You know, they, they've, they're business people. They, they know how to align their staff um, and they have the extra benefit of being able to motivate them with a paycheck. But mm -hmm. what I found out is that was all they were motivating their staff with is right. you will come in, you will be whatever I say that you're going to be because of a paycheck. And so then you have people coming into work and they're miserable. You know, they don't, they're in roles that don't match up with who they are and what their talents are. They don't like their job. They don't like their boss. They don't like their company. Um, they're, you know, sitting at the desk and dreaming about what else they could be doing, you know, searching on Indeed. And so to, to realize that when you invest in people, and when you put them, when you set them up for success, 
um, through knowing who they are and then connecting that with what you do as an organization, the, the results are exponential. You know, all of a sudden you've got people who are excited to come into work. They, they come in and um, so remember like in the eighties and nineties and hopefully not into the two thousands, but definitely in the nineties, everybody became about creating a mission statement. Right. Oh, we've got to have a mission statement. We've got to have a vision statement. Every organization's got to have one. And, you know, they're just these mantras up on a wall that nobody ever paid attention to. But when you have staff that are truly aligned with what the company is doing and you're, you've tapped into who they are as people, they come in, they can repeat that mission statement because it's in alignment with who they are. They're excited. They come in and they're like, yes, I get to work at this company and this is what we're doing. And I get to be a part of that. And, and they start to take on even a more of an ownership mentality as well. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. I, I tell people I have one job. I worked six years at a large firm um, and it was, it, I mean, it was good people. It was good pay, but it was soul sucking because it mm. just, um, and my wife and I talk about it. Well, she still works. She still has a corporate job. Hated. I, I, I hated Sunday nights because you're yeah. looking for, you know, a whole week. Um, can't wait for the weekend on Sunday nights. It's a horrible feeling. And uh, in that particular position, I hated, I hated the holidays because I was a tax consultant and I just knew how busy it was the first part of the year. And, oh, uh, yeah. and it wasn't really aligned with what I wanted to do. And I think there were opportunities in the firm where I could have, I could have, you know, nobody, nobody wanted to ask. Um, nobody, you know, they just wanted the job to get done. And, um, mm. you know, we were always afraid to be looking for another job because for God, God forbid, somebody would find out and it's, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. But I have heard of other firms where our, our competitors, where that wasn't the case, where mm-hmm. there was this ongoing conversation with people and basically saying, you know what, we know not everybody's going to be here forever. You know, right. the gold watch crowd, which is few and far between anymore. <laughs> we, we know that. How can we help you become the best that you can be? And and love us for the rest of your life, you know, go from being a, going from being a, an employee to a raving fan or a customer on the outside. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just, you know, I heard about those and kind of dreamt about it. It was just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a fascinating dynamic. Did you feel, well, to what extent, I guess I'll put it, I won't be a yes or no. To what extent do the, does the notion, it's tough to teach old dogs new tricks. So you have older companies, more mature environments. Mm-hmm. Is that more of a challenge or are they embracing this as well? Uh, it It's a bit of a challenge, but um, what they're coming to realize is, you know, that saying that says that, you'll go through a change when the pain of staying the same is too great. And so I think that companies are starting to see that uh, the pain of staying the same, they're going to become obsolete. I mean, I was talking, I was a guest on another podcast earlier this week, and we were talking about the fact that there's no more Toys R Us. Mm -hmm. Like you and I are of the generation, every Christmas, there was the Toys R Us catalog, the Christmas catalog. And that just was a part of who we were and, and who could imagine it's not like toys went away. You know, it, it's not like, um, Kodak who had to completely keep reinventing themselves because cameras changed and, and consumers use of cameras changed. Kids are still playing with toys and the toys are still the same, you know, Barbie's still out there you know, Nerf footballs are still out there. And yet because they didn't make the necessary changes, they became obsolete. I think that's put some fear into some company leaders. The other thing too, that I I really try to work on is so often that uncertainty that, oh, we're going to keep it this way comes from a place of insecurity Mm -hmm. and, and fear on the part of the leader. Like they're just 
they don't know how to be di- any different than who they've always been. So yeah. the value of having an executive coach, having a consultant is then there's somebody who can guide them through and kind of, you know, make sure that they have a safety net so that they're able to feel more secure in, in their own development. And it gives them an opportunity to, um, to celebrate the fact that not only are they growing and developing, but also the organization is. So this is all happening together and it and brings such a cohesion as well. You know, one of the, I guess one of the big changes that I want to kind of touch on this a little bit or get your thoughts on it. One of the big changes certainly between the eighties and the nineties and the, the new millennium is technology. Uh, I remember right. I, I talk to my kids about it all the time. Like when I was in college, you know, there were three computers on campus. So if you had a programming project, you had to, <laughs> you had to wait for that computer to be open, you know, the one in the library, because um, yeah. you didn't know where the other two were. But even when I went off to work and you know, I started my career in 1988, there was, there was one computer. Um, and if you had to type something, you gave it to the secretary, secretarial pool and, um, right. and, and, you know, you hand wrote it and they typed it. It was all very you know, it seemed very, it, it seemed very, uh, very cool at the time. I've got a secretary. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the blessing is, is we've moved from that. You know, my daughter started a job. They gave her a laptop. You know, everybody's got a laptop, dials into the cloud. My son starts a job. They email him a, a or they email him. They, uh, they overnight him a laptop. He works from home, works remotely. That's the blessing. But is there a curse to that as well? Because, you know, I get messages all the time from different people. I don't know if, you know, sometimes employers or so, we, we become less human, I guess. Yes. Is what... Yeah. And again, as we, we, you know, we tend to do this, we swing the pendulum one way and we go, oh, that is so amazing. And then we start seeing the flaws and the, and the problems with it. So then we swing the pendulum back the other way. The, the middle of technology is that, it is, it's both. And, and that's how life should be. It's never one way or the other. It should be a compilation of and. Yeah. When, you know, when, um, when HR people started getting so inundated with all the paperwork of onboarding staff, um, which, you know, they had so much paperwork because they had high employee turnover, which that's a whole different subject. But, sure. <laughs> um, but you know, they're so inundated. And so they're trying to find this, this way to be more efficient. And of course, you know, things like DocuSign and being able to send this stuff all through email, it is amazingly efficient, but we have to still recognize that even though we have all this technology available, we still have to recognize that there's a culture that cannot be uh, communicated through technology you know, the culture of an organization, the, the team dynamics, how do people really work together? What are, what are the nuances of our company? What are the nuances of our team? Those cannot be picked up through technology. We have to have that, still have that human connection. That is the great thing about things like Zoom, uh, Google Hangouts, Google Teams. It, it certainly changed things, uh, but, but even the importance of when we can, getting back into working together in the offices, it's never going to go back to what it was. Uh, No. And it shouldn't. Right. Totally agree. Totally Um, agree. I'm way more productive when I work at home than when I work in the office. But when I work in the office, I have those human interactions. You know, I'm less productive at the office because somebody's walking down the hallway, they see I'm in my office and they stop by, Hey, how was your weekend? Or, Hey, I've got this issue that I need to talk through. And so those impromptu meetings take place, um, being able to see and really get a sense of people, um, and, and how they're responding and, and, you know, that, that non, uh, nonverbal communication, you know, walking, walking to go get a drink, walking to the bathroom, you see people that, when you're working from home, you don't get to see, um, but it, it, it has to be a compilation of both. Um, yeah. even, even for those companies, I, the one great thing that I love about Google teams and, and even if somebody sets up their virtual workplace the right way, you can feel like you're still kind of all together, mm-hmm. even though 
everybody's working remotely. So, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you devote, you have a couple, uh, I've, I've made some notes on, on your, in your book here. Um, one section, treat everyone as individuals. And that is impossible. I mean, we talked about before we hit record with, you know, the, uh, the, the, I'm not picking on any of these, the constant contact, the eye contact. I mean, those are wonderful right. tools. They're very efficient. Yeah but they're not effective in building that relationship. It's one right. message that goes to one size fits all. And then you, you, know, you talk about let technology serve your people. Um, I've been of the mind and I'm not perfect at it, but I'm of the mind that, okay, technology is technology should be to drive, not drive out, but to tackle the administrative type things. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, I mean, you, you got to know that they've got a boy that, Johnny that plays t-ball right I mean those are the things that right at the end of the day people go home and they uh that's why they work they've got families they they weren't put on this earth to serve the company um exactly yeah but man I felt like that when I worked in public accounting and I you know I <laughs> well you know to be honest I think it was part of the time it was just they, the guy who runs the firm now was somebody that was there when I was there started with me great guy Um, he's been in charge for 20 plus years now. And prior to that, there was just kind of a, you know, it was a smattering of two years with this person, two years with this person Mm. and, you know, nothing was hitting. Um, but again, you know, it's the eighties, it's the nineties. It's, um, it was management by objective and, you know, look, look at the numbers and let's drive at these things. And so it's, you know, it's easy, it's easy to vilify the past, right? It's easy to vilify the past. In fact, I had a conversation with a friend and she was telling me, she was pointing to like tech companies, look at this, they've got ping pong tables and all this stuff. It's great. (laughs) You know, GM needs to do that. And it's like, well, these are different eras, different companies, you know, tech companies have a huge margin on what they do. So they can afford to have somebody out there playing ping pong. Whereas if you have something where the margins are much thinner, um, it just doesn't work that way. Um, yeah. It's just culturally it's different, but. You know. We were so driven in the eighties and nineties. We were so driven and, and we did not care about people. We didn't care about our team. We didn't care about the people we worked with. We didn't care about each other. You know, it was, you go in and you get your job done and, you know, you, when you walk through those doors, anything in your personal life stays outside the door, you're focused, um, you know, and that changed as technology changed, you know, there's, there's absolutely no way that even at work that I'm ever going to be disconnected from my kids. Yeah. And if they call me or they text me, I have a special ringtone. And so I know when it's family and if they call me and text me, I, I don't care what I'm doing. I'm going to stop and answer that because it's yeah. family. And so that, that has brought together this blending of, of realizing that it, I may be at work, but my personal life is always going to be an influencing factor in my performance. Well, so how I, do we navigate that? Yeah. And I think we've got to make this transition from now I'm self-employed. So I, I think about it tw- I, and I love what I do, right? I love what I do. So I don't ever, ever really feel like I'm working. Um, yeah. But we've got to get away from in that. When I say we people in general get away from this, it's nine to five. It's, you know, there's oh, a, yeah, there's a job that needs to be done. My wife and I had this conversation this morning because she works for an organization that's going through a split. And one part of the split is, you know what you Come July 1, we're all back in the office. And the other part of the mm. split is, you know, we're pretty productive doing it. Just the, this COVID has taught us a lot. Um, <laughs> and you don't necessarily have to. And my wife's like, you know what? I think that's going to be a problem for the one that's kind of forcing it because there'll be people who are like, you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to, uh, you know, it's, it's a 30 minute commute for me to get to the office. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. It's not horrible but I'm willing to give that extra 30 minutes to the company because I'm ready. I'm dressed. I'll go sit down and my, you know, I don't really need to worry right. about what to wear. I will give that to the company um, in exchange for being at home. Yep. And I think companies are finding people are more productive 
Um, yeah. To your point. But we do need to come together, you know, but I think there's a, there's a blend there. Um, yeah. Agreed. It, there, if there's work that can be done outside of the office, that's going to allow, you know, and this goes taps into like employee engagement. If, if your staff is going to be more productive, more excited about the company and about the work that they're doing, you know, when you, when you start, when you walk away from it's 40 hours a week and make it about, here's the things that need to be accomplished. Some weeks that's going to take 40 hours. Some weeks that's going to take 10 hours. I don't care how long it takes you. I'm paying you X amount of dollars with the expectation that you're going to fulfill this task. You give people the ability to then use their own creativity and really use their strengths. And you have just this uh, increased engagement. Um, and you have people who are more excited about being a part of what's happening. We, we need to think about paying people for what they accomplish, not for uh, how long it takes them. Because yeah. I worked for a company and they required me to A, be in the office. So it was a 45 minute commute each way, which I knew, I knew that when I took the job, um, I didn't know I was going to have to be in the office every day. And the expectation was you're going to be there eight to five. Um, the company culture was that you worked through lunch. And so uh, that's nine hours plus an hour and a half of commuting. Mm -hmm. And really the job could have been done in about 20 hours. And so I literally had to spend time going, yeah. how can I look productive? Yeah. <laughs> what can I be doing? You know, what a colossal waste. Yeah. It, it's such a waste of resources. Yeah. So. Well, let's shift gears here a little bit. Let's talk about link things you're working on things that people can refer to you or opportunities you're looking for. Um, I appreciate yeah. what you've shared, but I want to certainly give you the, a platform here. So. Oh, thank you. I love what I'm doing with link right now. Um, link is two and a half years old, but um, it had a year of COVID. So yeah. <laughs> like everybody. 50% else, so. of your existence has been through COVID. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but I, I had an opportunity to really make some great connections and, and continue to really hone in on what it is that I want to be doing. And so I love helping those businesses. Um, and my focus is smaller businesses. You know, these companies that have like 40 employees or less, they're, they're my heartbeat because they're doing great work and they want, so often I find that they want to get better, that they want to have somebody come in and, and help. Um, but they, most of the time they can't afford it. And, um, and they, or the mindset is they think that they can't afford it. So they forget to ask for help. So going in and being able to help them realize who is their staff, who's on their team right now. Um, I, I talk about when I'm sharing with some companies, I can help you create a whole brand new team without a single new hire, you know, just being able to to watch that transformation of how people learn about each other, how they learn about themselves, mm -hmm. how managers and leaders are able to um, take them and set them up for their best success and being the best version of themselves. So that's really what I'm doing. I've also kind of branched off into doing some recruiting um, with my psychology background. What I love about doing that is that, again, really defining what is the role who is it that you want to hire? And then let's craft an ad based on psychology stuff. Let's craft an ad that's going to be attractional to those candidates. So you, we're not wasting time, you mm -hmm. know, going through resumes that are just not appropriate or, or even, um, you know, going through um, interviews with people who just aren't the right fit. Let's, let's attract the right ones and then set them up for success. So, um, so link is, yeah, oh. go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, no, what's, what's a good way for people to get a hold of you? Um, so they can find me at either linkconsulting.info. It's L-I-N-K consulting.info. Or they can find me um, on LinkedIn. It's my favorite place to hang out. I mean, you both. I'll get, uh, <laughs> I'll get your uh, website address in the uh, 
in the show notes. So I really yeah. appreciate your time today. This was this was great. Oh, it's great to be here. And if you know, if your listeners, if they go to the website, um, I have a I have the ebook that you mentioned, and it's just right up at the top. And it's the ultimate guide to bringing out the best in your people. I am giving that away. So I, I love to um, just put stuff in people's hands right away. So if they go to the website, they can get that for free today. Thanks for joining us on the Networking Rx podcast. Please put what you've learned into action today and let us know if you have questions, comments, or ideas for future topics. You can email them to us at podcast at amspirit.com. That's A-M-S-P-I-R-I-T dot com. Finally, so you never miss an episode, be sure to subscribe to the Networking Rx podcast through iTunes, Overcast, or however you receive your podcasts. Now get out and network with someone. The Networking Rx podcast is a copyright production of Amspirit Business Connection. All rights reserved.